Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Metro Board of Directors meeting of March 10th. Uh, we are here this evening to receive public comment on the fiscal year 2022 proposed budget. I am Metro Board Chair Paul Smedberg, and I represent the Commonwealth of Virginia on the Metro Board of Directors. I'm joined this evening by Walter Alcorn, a fellow board member who represents Fairfax County on the Metro Board. Welcome to the fourth and final virtual public hearing on Metro's proposed fiscal year 2022 budget. This hearing is convened by the Metro Board of Directors to gather public comment on two dockets, B21-01 on Metro's proposed fiscal year 2022 through 2027 capital improvement program and strategic plan and docket B21-02 on Metro's proposed fiscal year 2022 operating budget and related service and fare proposals and changes to parking rates at some of Prince George's County's stations. Notice of this hearing was made in publication uh, or by publication in the Washington Post and ads were placed in the AFRO, AREF, Dine, El Tiempo Latino, Epoch Times, the Iran Times, Korean Times, and the Washington Hispanic, and as well through social media and on several radio stations. And signs were placed in all Metro rail stations and on buses, Metro access vehicles, at Metro bus information centers and over 300 bus stops. Since we're doing this hearing virtually, the hearing is going to look and feel a little different than usual, than our, than our usual in-person hearings. At this point, we would normally have a presentation from our chief financial officer, but in order to get right to your comments and testimony, we have instead posted a video at wamata.com forward slash budget that provides an overview of next year's proposed budget. However, before we begin the hearing, uh, hearing uh, tonight's hearing, I wanna note that with the expected passage of this week's additional COVID relief funding, Metro will be revising its fiscal year 2022 budget accordingly. It will take some time to calculate exactly how much funding Metro will receive from the $1.4 billion coming to the DC uh, region's transit agencies, but we will be able to advert the painful service cuts and layoffs that were on the table when we began the process in January. With that bit of good news, I'd like to turn to the portion of this evening where we hear from our speakers. Those of you wishing to provide testimony should call Area code 512-580-8850. Again, 512-580-8850. After calling in, you will need to enter a four digit meeting code. For this evening's meeting, the code is 91 Four one. Again, the code for this evening's meeting is 9141. Once you're in the meeting, you will be able to listen over the phone by pressing star one. If you would like to provide testimony, you can press star three and you will be put in the speaker's queue. You'll get a message when it's your turn to speak. Again, if you would like to just simply listen, star one. And if you would like to speak, star three, and you will be placed in the speaker's queue. For those of you who are on the line now, if you want to speak, please go ahead and press star three to get in the queue. If you're watching the hearing live on a different device, please make sure to mute the device so that there isn't feedback will be able to listen to the hearing while you wait in the phone queue. 
If you would like to provide oral testimony, but aren't able to wait until you, uh, you know, your, your turn is uh, arrived in the queue, you can press star two to leave a voicemail. Again, if you're unable to stay with us the entire time before you're allowed to speak in the queue, please press star two to leave a voicemail. Your voicemail will be transcribed and included in the hearing record. In order for the public record to accurately reflect who's providing testimony and comment, I'd like to ask that you please state your name and any organization you represent before beginning your testimony. Elected officials will be allowed up to five minutes and everyone else will be allowed up to three minutes each. Extra time will be given for translation if needed. We ask that you stay within your time limit because we want to make sure everyone who wants to speak has the chance to be heard. I also want to note that each speaker is only able to speak once at each hearing. While you may have the option to rejoin the speaker's queue, please note that we cannot accept additional testimony at this hearing. I want to also take this moment to recognize that this is where we listen to you. This is your opportunity to comment on the proposals on the table for the fiscal year 2022 budget, but we are here to listen. We will not be able to answer questions during your testimony. Before you begin your remarks again, please state your name and any organization you represent, if any. Please note that all statements, including any personal information, such as a name, email address, address, or phone number you provide in the statement, are releasable to the public upon request and may be posted on WMATA's website without change, including any personal information provided. Further testimony may be submitted and must be received by 5 p.m. on Tuesday March 16th. Again, if you'd like to submit written testimony, it must be received by 5 p.m. on Tuesday, March 16th. Testimony can be submitted online at wamada.com forward slash budget. Again, wamada.com forward slash budget. Online, you have the option to one, complete a survey, two, write free-form comments, and last, upload a letter, petition, or other document. You can also mail testimony to the Office of the Secretary, WMATA, 600 Fifth Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20001. Again, WMATA, 600 Fifth Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 2000 or 20001. Again, all testimony must be received by 5 p.m. on March 16th. Due to the pandemic and the slowdown in mail service, we encourage everyone to submit comments online if possible. Your comments will become part of the public, public record and will be reviewed by the WMATA Board of Directors. Changes to the options presented here tonight may be proposed in response to testimony received and subsequent staff analysis. And now finally, it's time to uh, hear from you and call on our first witness. Again, as a reminder, please tell us your name and any organization you represent before you speak. And as a friendly reminder, I. Uh, staff will unmute the speakers one by one from the speaker's queue. And please note that there could be a bit of a lag while switching between speakers. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. So Eleanor, when you're ready, we're ready for our first speaker. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Yes, uh, my name is 
Yes, my name is William Sloth. I actually spoke at another session you had, sir. Um, I just, I'm calling in for this session, too. Um, I don't represent an organization. I live in uh, Fairfax County. And a couple of comments um, regarding Box 2A. I noticed under the current information on the website, it looks like you're going to maintain that. But then it had a link to some proposed changes. It looks like you're not going to maintain it. I just want to state bus 2A, that's 2 alpha, is crucial to have. It's the only transportation where people go into the city of Falls Church. There's no other, there's no other art or Fairfax County bus to go there. Um, so going to the city of Falls Church, Lee Highway, it is the only transportation available. And it also goes by Kaiser Permanente, which is really important to have a public transit to go by the Kaiser facility in Falls Church. So just calling to emphasize that bus 2A should be maintained. Um, it's an integral route. It should be, it, it should be maintained. I um, also want to state, um, I also would encourage Metro to, on weekends, to have some sort of service after 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. on Friday and Saturday. Um, one idea might be if it's not cost feasible to run the trains on Friday and Saturday from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m., you might want to have some sort of bus um, from Boston or otherwise that could provide uh, service between 9 p.m. and 11 p.m., maybe sort of shuttle every half hour or so. It's really crucial for nightlife to have that option. Um, also, I noticed where there's a proposal to lower the parking fees in PG County. I personally don't understand why that's necessary. Um, I don't think the parking fee should be lower anywhere, particularly, particularly one jurisdiction. I think it's totally wrong to do that. Um, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Slump. All right, our next speaker. Again, just as a reminder, there will be a little lag. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, if we can, welcome. Great, thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is James Harnett, and I'm a resident of the District of Columbia. Uh, I want to strongly encourage the board uh, in both the upcoming fiscal year budget and in future budgetary considerations, reject any plans to name stations after private companies, uh, either for free or for a fee. While conversations have been authorized by the board chair uh, with private companies to discuss the potential renaming of stations, given the hundreds of millions of dollars of losses in revenue for the system due to the pandemic, it is clear that with the new leadership in the White House, transportation systems throughout the United States should come to expect continued hundreds of millions or billions of dollars in investment in rail, buses, and the transit options that strengthen this region and our country. Our public transit system is owned by the public, not private companies. I would encourage the board not to bow to pressure uh, from legislators or those who seek to strong arm uh, the WMATA board into their own political personal agendas. Um, that's the only comment I have. So thank you all for your time. Thank you, Mr. Harnett. All right, Eleanor, our next speaker. Again, for those of you just joining us, there will be a little bit of a lag here between speakers. Hi, can you hear me? I can, or we can. Welcome. Thank you. My name, my name is Jim, and I'm a homeowner in Virginia Square. And Jim, I've attended this meeting name? to vehemently oppose. Jim, I'd prefer what's your not to say name? if that's okay. What's that? I would prefer not to say if that's okay. Okay. All right, thank you. So the first reason is that uh, the closure of the Virginia Square station would have a severe negative impact on the local community. When one stands at the Virginia Square Station, all one sees is high-rise commercial and residential buildings that are filled with commuters. Commuters who packed the station prior to the pandemic and who, due to the availability of COVID vaccines, 
can be expected to return to heavily using the station during precisely the time period that Ramada proposes closing it. And it seems nonsensical to propose closing a station exactly when a substantial portion of the residents who depend on it and who pay for it are expecting to use it most heavily. In addition, Ramada must take into consideration those residents who, whether they are elderly, disabled, or for other reasons, rely on the Virginia Square station for basic transit needs. For such residents, it would be no remedy to suggest that they simply walk to Boston Metro, because in some cases that may not be a practical option. Further still, Arlington prides itself on being a community where residents can get around without a car, but the proposed closure of the Virginia Square Station is diametrically opposed to that notion of Arlington as being a car-free municipality. The second reason that I strenuously oppose the closure of the Virginia Square Station is that, in my opinion, even raising the mere possibility of closing a station reflects a failure of Ramada to engage with its congressional delega delegation and local governments to secure the funding it needs to maintain service levels. Ensuring widespread access to the metro system should be among the highest governmental priorities, much like ensuring widespread access to, for example, electricity should be. But it would be absurd if a local electric utility threatened to withhold service from, or even hinted at withholding service from, a substantial fraction of its users, because that would convey that the utility has failed the fundamental objective of ensuring its continued operation. Here, it feels as though Wamada has offloaded the responsibility of lobbying Congress and local governments for funding to its customers and to the taxpayers. But given the burdens that residents and taxpayers have already had to carry for the past year, it is a sin sincerely depressing thought. So in closing, I urge Wamada to significantly increase its efforts to work with Congress and local governments to ensure that no station need be closed, especially not the Virginia Square Station. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Eleanor, our next call. Yeah, and we registered her and we were looking for, we've been looking for her phone number, but we have not seen it. For what, it, could you just confirm the phone number she's calling from? Thank you so much. Again, for those of you just joining us, welcome to the Wamata Board of Directors uh, fiscal year 2022 proposed budget public hearing. And we are waiting for our next speaker to join. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you, we can hear you, welcome. Thank you, well, thank you very much. I'm Sally Horn and I'm speaking tonight on behalf of the Greater Tyson Citizen Coalition, which is a multi-jurisdictional coalition comprised of concerned citizens, organizations and communities in and around Tyson's. We have uploaded a letter to the WMATA board on the WMATA link. So tonight I'll just summarize our key points. We are pleased that the Congress has passed the COVID relief bill and that it will soon be signed by the president. We are hopeful that WMATA will receive sufficient federal funding to maintain the existing levels of bus and rail service throughout the second half of fiscal year 2022. However, in the event that the that cuts are still necessary, we urge you not to cut service at the McLean Rail Station for the following five reasons. First, closing the McLean Rail Station would defeat the goals of reducing traffic congestion and encouraging the use of public transit. Goals we strongly support in as much as our area has routinely experienced high levels of traffic congestion from commuters and our public transit options are very limited. Second, the McLean Metro Station is the only rail station of the four stations in the tysons McLean area that has nearby commuter parking for users of Metro. Since most of McLean is not on a bus line, McLean residents must drive to a Metro station to access public transportation. Third, the McLean Metro Station is the second busiest Metro station of the four that I mentioned. It is also the station that serves the CAP One headquarters and its employees, the Capital One Performing Arts Theater in Tyson's that will open in the fall and other businesses such as Wegmans. As more people are vaccinated and return to work or feel, feel safe enough to venture out for entertainment, and certainly by early in calendar year 2022, it is not unreasonable to assume that ridership will return and grow if the station is open. Fourth, bus service is not a viable alternative for us. WMATA does not plan to operate bus routes from the McLean Rail Station into DC during this, this first six months of calendar year 2022. 
And further, none of the few operational Fairfax operated bus routes have stops at the McLean rail station that provide direct service to any place outside of Virginia or to the other metro stations in the Tyson's McLean area. And finally, based on the data provided by WMATA, it would appear that the anticipated cost of closing the rail station is about $450,000 for the first six months of calendar year 2022. If federal funding does not fully close the overall budget gap, we urge you to find savings elsewhere and keep our McLean rail station open. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Horn. Appreciate those comments. Uh, Eleanor, our next speaker. Good evening, Mr. Smedberg. Uh, Dave Snyder, represent the city of Falls Church. Um, I serve, as you know, vice chairman of the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority, and I serve on the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission and COGS Transportation Planning Board. I personally, in the city of Falls Church, have long been the strongest possible supporters of both Metro Rail and Metro Bus, and we hope to continue to do so. The points that I want to make this evening are, first of all, in terms of bus service, you've already heard at least one citizen from adjoining Fairfax County talk about the importance of the 2A bus system. The City of Falls Church relies totally on Metro for its bus service, does not have a local bus service, and so very much request the continuation of the 28A and the 2A bus lines as fundamental to essential workers our citizens and the citizens of the surrounding area. Secondly, with regard to budgeting, um, we certainly support those citizens who have already spoken against at totally closing any stations as self-defeating um, and putting other interests ahead of riders. Secondly, um, headways uh, as proposed of 30 minutes uh, would discourage um, all but um, the most uh, dedicated uh, rail um, users who have no other alternative. So we urge that in future budget dis considerations and discussions that the notion of closing stations or 30-minute headways be rolled out, especially in the case of FY22, where it's expected that the third and fourth quarters is where we will really see a rebound of ridership. We hope, as do you, that the current federal funding will make the worst of the doomsday budget scenario um, unnecessary, but we urge that in any future discussions about budget that the notion of closing stations and 30-minute headways not be on the, um, the agenda, but instead much more nuanced and careful uh, consideration of necessary service cuts. Let me end where I began. These are extraordinary times and the board, the Metro management and the employees are all to be commended for dealing with unprecedented challenges. And I wanna thank you very much for the consideration of all of our comments, holding this hearing and the comments of uh, other citizens. Thank you. Thank you, council member Schneider. And as always, so uh, Mr. Elkhorn and I always appreciate your comments. Thank you. Uh, Eleanor, our next speaker. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Welcome. Hi, this is Daniel Palmer. I reside in Alexandria and I just represent myself. Okay. I do have issues in following many of these similar comments that other, other people have mentioned regarding the high density areas where you do have a lot of, a lot of um, residential as well as commercial areas where people are generally operating, util utilizing public transportation almost exclusively or very close to exclusively. And so they rely on this public transportation. In particular, I live near Braddock Station and I use the Metroway one bus um, frequently to go around just for normal routine transport routine needs of say if I went to one of the stores or something like that. I have seen a lot of people use this even during COVID 
But I do believe the data isn't correct because what I've seen since I've frequently read this is that the bus um, scanners were not working properly. So these numbers are probably 400% below what was reported in terms of ridership. And from the times I see, there's usually, I understand this less than what it was prior to this, but there's usually um, five plus people on the bus during during peak times. In, in the past, it's been a lot more during pre-COVID, which will probably restore once once people are going back to work and getting out of their house once everybody is vaccinated. The other issue I do have is is regarding some of these metro stations that are proposed to be closed, especially ones that are in near um, that are inside these areas where you have concentrated um, buildings, and in terms of having these res these shopping areas as well as as well as residential areas, and there's quite a few that have been developed all around metro. With that, in my, with that in mind, where people don't have to rely on cars to get around, and they rely on public transportation. Is that it, Mr. Palmieri? Did we lose you? Yes. That's it. Oh, okay. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate your comments. Okay, Eleanor, our next speaker. And again, for those of you who may be joining us, welcome to the Metro Board of Directors Fiscal Year 2022 Proposed Budget Public Hearing. Also, as a reminder, we do have a little bit of a lag between each speakers with the phone bridge. But... Hello, everyone. My name is Alan Eichelberg. Uh, I'm not here representing any group, just a uh, private citizen living in Arlington County. Um, I was just calling in to express comment over um, the concept of uh, closing metro stations. Um, while personally, my wife and I use the East Falls Church metro station to commute to work every day, um, I'm sure that we're not alone with many of the other private citizens that are listening in on this conversation um, and participating. Uh, I'm not here to advocate just for the East Falls Church Metro Station. I think that we need to think more uh, regionally about the health of our community um, and the citizens that rely on public transportation uh, to get to and from work and other critical components of their lives. Uh, I, I find myself a little bit confused about how closing stations would ultimately solve the overall problem. Uh, it seems to me that Metro has a problem with a lack of ridership and reducing access to the ability to participate as a consumer of public transit seems counterintuitive in terms of resolving that overall issue. Um, I'm sure that it is a complex situation, one that's probably uh, beyond any one individual to resolve, um, but I think that the idea of closing down access to critical public transit in a period after a pandemic recovery um, will be particularly harmful to businesses that rely on that commuter access as well. Uh, I just think for myself about how many times my wife and I have taken the metro downtown to Arlington to one of the other stations there to enjoy a dinner or a meal and have chosen to do that as responsible citizens with a uh, public transportation ride home uh, after, after dinner. Um, I think that it's very important that these services continue to operate and as opposed to considering opportunities to cut services and costs, I would encourage the WMATA board to evaluate opportunities to provide their service to customers in a more efficient way that will increase ridership and improve reliability of the system uh, because I think closing metro stations will only 
permanently lose more riders after those stations may reopen, uh, and it may set forth an irreversible cycle of metro closures. That's all I have to say, other than thank you for your time and hearing me out. Thank you, Mr. Eichelberg. Appreciate those comments. Again, uh, as a reminder, uh, for those of you who are on the phone or who have recently joined, uh, if you would like to uh, make a testimony and to be placed in the speaker's queue, please press star three. And if you would like to leave testimony on our voicemail, which will be transcribed for the official record, please press star two. Again, if you'd like to speak, um, push star three to get in the queue and star two to leave testimony. Eleanor, our next speaker. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. Well, hello. First of all, I'd like to thank you for your time today. My name is Christian Mussenden, and I can spell my last name. Mussenden is M-U-S-S-E-N-D-E-N. And I'm a member of Sunrise DC, and I'm also a DC metro area. I'm calling regarding my concern over the budget proposal. The current budget proposal would provide severe hardships for our BIPOC communities, the working class, the elderly, and the disabled. This proposal, which calls for eliminating the entire bus lines and shutting down metro stations, is very short-sighted from an economic standpoint, is also unnecessarily cruel and discriminatory. On top of that, I believe that we must start considering the environmental impacts that this may have. We're nearing a point of no return in our environmental crisis, so we need to be investing in green energy and sustainable infrastructure like our metro. The news of federal funding is encouraging, but I want to reiterate that the metro is an invaluable service that we provide to our residents. It's not a privilege that we need to continually fight in the for. I again thank you for your time and I urge you to consider my comments and use the federal and city dollars to avoid any budget cuts to the Metro. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Wessenden. Eleanor, our next speaker. While we're waiting for our next speaker again, if you'd like to speak, please push star three. And if you'd like to leave a voicemail with your testimony, please push star two. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Hi. Good that you can Hi. hear me. Um, <laughs> um, my name is Ellie Weller, and I am calling on the behalf of Sunrise Movement DC, and I am a former resident of Northern Virginia who has used Walmart's Metrorail and Metroplex systems since I was 12 years old. So for me, that's 14 years. So. These budget cuts are extremely concerning in the fact that as a disabled person and as a person of working class poor, as a um, person who has lived within multiple BIPOC communities who have suffered grave injustices environmentally, socially, and so on, these cuts, especially within the lights of Virginia, such as 25B, uh, 16, um, the 16 lines, the 2A, the 1A, these are lines that essential workers, especially with their BIPOC views in Northern Virginia, rely on. These are also uh, lines that disabled people have used. And I have experienced what cuts can do with the ART uh, bus, which is the um, Arlington Transit Centers, DASH within Alexandria, and Fairfax Connectors within Fairfax County. Additionally, um, most of the lines are that you're proposing cuts for within D.C., effectively not just disproportionately affect um, BIPOC communities, but also disabled communities. These are invaluable resources for disabled folks. These are invaluable resources for BIPOC folks. These are invaluable resources for the unprivileged, for the poor and for the working class, because unfortunately, as um, my previous colleague have mentioned, we are in a climate crisis and these climate crises cannot be further ignored. And the green energy that the Metro Rail would be able to provide is something that we need. So we need to keep reinvesting in Metro Rails and maybe possibly consider um, defunding um, services that do harm to our communities and reinvest in services that will actually be safer for us because cutting like this will actually propose more of a threat um, and more violence 
uh, than good. Anyway, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Eleanor, our next speaker. Again, just as a reminder, there is a bit of a lag uh, getting the speakers queued up here. And once again, as a reminder, if you'd like to speak, push star three on your phone. And if you'd like to leave testimony and voicemail, please push star two. And I'm being told, uh, that is it for speakers. We will give it just a few seconds here to see if anyone chimes in at the last minute. Okay, we may have one speaker that is on mute so that is trying to get through. A uh, speaker with the last four digits, one, four, six, nine. And we have one other caller in addition to that. It's been trying to get on. While we're waiting, I uh, wanted to- Hello, uh, yes, go hello ahead, Mr. Sir. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, great, thank you. Who's this? Thank you, uh, board chairs. Uh, this is Robert Gowdy. I'm the executive director of the Reston Town Center Association, which is the community governing association for the Reston Town Center District. Hi, Robert. I wanna thank hi. you and Supervisor Alcorn for tonight's uh, meeting. Uh, I was calling in to testify in support of opening the Reston Town Center Metro Rail Station together with the rest of the phase two silver line as soon as construction and testing of the system allow, and in opposition to any plan to reduce levels of service or to consider temporary closures once those stations are opened. But I understood from your very helpful comments at the outset of the meeting, uh, Board Chair Smedberg, that those kinds of service uh, level reductions are now off the table with the passage of the new uh, emergency funding plan uh, through the Congress today. So in the interest of respecting your time and everyone else's, I'll leave my testimony here tonight at that, uh, and I'll submit written testimony. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. And I believe we have one final speaker. We're waiting to get through the speaker's bridge here. Hello, can you hear me? We can, Hello. Sherry Randall. How are you? Very good. <laughs> I am well. How are all of you doing? Good, good. Well, I'm good here evening, with uh, Walter Alcorn um, and the others listening. Well, uh, it's, it's nice to talk to you all. And first, let me say that, yes, I'm Phyllis Randall. I'm chair of the Loudoun County Board of Supervisors and chair of the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority. And first, let me say that I hope all of you are doing well and hope your families are healthy. Um, I do thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight regarding the, the proposed FY2022 WMATA budget. I understand that WMATA, and this is the good news, that uh, we learned today that you're going to be expecting additional federal aid from the American Recovery Plan that passed today in the House, and it is slated to be signed by the president. So that is very good news, much welcome, welcome news. Having said that, I do want to express my strong concerns regarding any possible delays to the opening of the Silver Line Phase 2, which, is, which, um, which we'd like to see open when the system is ready to begin revenue service. Loudoun County has invested millions of dollars into the construction of Silver Line Phase 2, along with additional millions to reorient our road system to the metro system, modify transit system routing, and we plan, we're planning for future developments to and around the metro stations. In Loudoun, our metro stations include the Loudoun Gateway, the Ashburn Metro Station, and the Dulles Metro Station that, as you all know, is located in Dulles Airport. 
Dallas Airport um, and the Metro Rail Station that will be in Dallas Airport will serve as an international gateway to the region. Passengers and employees from all across the region will be utilizing the Metro, the Metro Rail system to and from that location in particular. Our investments um, that we made to bring Metro to Loudoun will reap benefits to localities and to the Ramada and to Ramada for years to come in econ- economic development, increased ridership on the Metro Rail system, and it's going to strengthen the Washington economy and the Ramada system. I'll give you an example. In Loudoun County, there are 1,280 acres of development and greenfield opportunities surrounding the Civil Line, from Innovation Center to the Ashburn Station, where future success is predicated on Metro. As currently approved, those developments, just those developments alone, account for 16,500 residential units and and over 21 million square feet of commercial uh, uh, mixed-use development. Loudoun is projected to increase the population to over a half million by 2030, and most of that growth will be seen in eastern Loudoun County along the Metro Civil Line Corridor. Metro access is a key factor in our new office development, um, and our office development is dependent on proximity, proximity to where the workforce lives. And we, what we know is that workforce wants to live through the net metro, near the metro stations and have all the amenities that a transportation line like Metro will provide. In FY 2019, Metro ridership generated 81% of fare revenues. Increasing ridership on Metro Rail supports the entire Ramada system. Finally, I want to say that um, we all appreciate the CARES Act funding that was distributed to localities last spring. I understand that additional funds from the CRISA Act may also be allocated to local jurisdictions, and these funds have helped and will continue to help our uh, our system running in the COVID-19. Um, actually, this is really my family. I know how hard you all have been working. I know how tough this has been for all of all of us. And um, I do want to say how much I appreciate it. You know, there have been a lot of ups and downs this year in COVID, a lot of things that have been unexpected, and it has not been lost on Loudoun County, on our board, or on me, how hard the Metro board has been looking. So I want to thank you and tell you all that I'm going to invite you all out here when we cut the, um, cut the ribbon on the Silver Line Station, and we hope that's sooner and not later. So thank you for listening to me this evening. You all take care. Thank you, Chair Randall, and we appreciate the, you know, your appointment of uh, Mr. Letourneau, Supervisor Letourneau, uh, to the various transportation bodies, and we very much enjoy working with him on the Metro Board, so appreciate that and appreciate your comments. Uh, I understand we have one additional speaker, Eleanor. Speaker 1312 is next. Hello, can you hear me? We can, welcome. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I'm, my name is Barbara Millville, and I cannot wait to ride Metro again. I have to say that, I've missed it. And I'm representing the National Capital Citizens with Low Vision, and I have low vision myself. I am using a uh, closed circuit television to um, read my comments. And so I, I thought I'd share with that, that with you since you can't see what I'm doing here. Anyhow, um, I'm, I'm uh, testifying because uh, Jim Hamry and Phil Posner uh, recommended that I do so. And I wanted to share how the current and possibly future service change proposals would impact this group and seniors as well. Our riders are unable to walk an additional 1.6 miles to and from an alternate bus stop. There isn't enough time for our riders to learn a new travel route. It takes a month or more and there is a long wait list. In Fairfax County, where I live, our riders are afraid due to the numerous pedestrian fatalities Uh, which occurred while trying to cross streets. There simply aren't enough um, traffic signals, lighting, and sidewalks near the bus stop yet. 
many of these riders are not eligible for paratransit or don't care to use it. Pandemic or not, many of these bus routes are farther out and tend to have lower ridership numbers. As a result, they will always be on the metro chopping block if metro is forced to cut service. We hope this pandemic will be over soon. Jim's beard is getting quite long. <laughs> we appreciate if we'd appreciate it if you would get with Jim and the AAC to develop a plan for how to handle the needs of this special needs population. If you're unable to Handle this soon, I'm afraid these riders will decide to instead take the more costly metro access. Thank you so much during this very trying year. I do understand that you folks are really working hard and we appreciate appreciate the difficult position you are put in right now. Well, we thank you very much for your comments, Ms. Millville. Uh, and the board and I know staff very much very much appreciates the collaborative and close relationship we have with the, the AAC and Mr. Posner uh, and the other and the other members of that committee have really contributed quite a bit uh, over the years and we expect they will continue to do so as we begin to to build back um, so I appreciate that uh, Eleanor, do we have uh, any additional speakers? We just have one more speaker. A few seconds here. Okay, I'm told uh, Barbara was our last speaker. So I wanna thank everyone. Uh, I'm going to give one last call for testimony. Okay, we have no more speakers. Uh, this hearing is now concluded. Testimony again can be submitted online or via the US mail as long as it is as long as it is received by metro by 5 p.m. on Monday March 16th again we must receive your testimony and comments via online or US mail by 5 p.m. on Monday March 16th thank you again for joining us and taking the time to provide your testimony